crisis. The Maduro regime is increasingly protecting itself from mounting international pressure and sanctions at the expense of its natural resources and pristine biodiversity. Um, unfortunately, without a negotiated solution or change in government, um, the regime will likely continue to irreversibly damage the environment, silence environmental uh, activists and indigenous communities, and continue to relinquish Venezuelan national territory and sovereignty to Colombian guerrilla groups and other foreign state and non-state actors. Um, so ultimately, you know, it's the environment, it's the human aspect, but it's also threatening hemispheric security. So I'm just going to run through a few um, key points. Um, you're going to see a map of Venezuela, and um, you'll see that there's a red uh, region there. That's the Arco Minero de los So this is the Orinoco mining arc. Um, as the oil industry was dismantled by Maduro and Chavez, basically they started opening up the pristine south. So everything that you see in green is southern Venezuela, south of the Orinoco, and it's 80% of which is protected areas. So Venezuela was on the forefront of conservation in the 20th century. And that came to a crashing stop with the um, arrival of Hugo Chavez in power. So illegal uh, land grabbing, deforestation, and out of control gold rush uh, in protected rainforest areas have created a perfect storm combining environmental degradation with a humanitarian crisis. And massive sediment loads um, from mining are decimating our reservoirs and hydropower generation capacity, while mercury from gold extraction policies, uh, sorry, gold extraction are polluting rivers and sickening tens of thousands of indigenous people and miners and non-indigenous people. <coughs> um, SOS Minoco was the first to start mine, um, mapping this uh, environmental catastrophe in 2018. Um, I started asking why nobody was making, asking any questions about illegal mines inside Ganaima World Heritage Site, and the answer was, we live in fear. If we denounce this, this is for Venezuelan academics and experts, if we denounce it, we'll be killed or we'll be thrown into in prison. So um, we started to document uh, and learn and denounce the exercise that was otherwise being ignored by international media, NGOs, um, and was being silenced internally. So mapping and understanding of uh, mining footprint is only possible in Venezuela with high resolution satellite images. It's almost impossible to go to this area. Um, so we use open source tools to denounce uh, state secrets. Um, we use other tools such as Twitter, newsletters, um, and basically it's open source uh, intelligence, they call it. The economists did a, a very interesting piece on how civil society is using open source intelligence to denounce this kind of thing. So if we go to the next slide, okay, I took away all of the green areas and what you see now is the mine footprint. Um, Venezuela is at the top uh, of the list of Amazonian countries with the highest number of illegal mines. And <clears throat> with high resolution satellite images, we have been able to map this footprint. To date, we have mapped 90,000 hectares in 900, uh, sorry, 90,000, yeah, 90,000 hectares, sorry, 90,000 sector in 900 sectors mining sectors, okay? But this number is constantly increasing. And in uh, Guyana, the, the Esequibo region, which is a whole other story, we've mapped 100,000 hectares. Um, this is uh, incredible. This includes 
29 sectors of illegal mining inside Ganaima National Park, which is a whole World Heritage Site. Um, and this is an area which is inhabited by 27 indigenous groups, all with their unique culture, language, and so forth. And this is affecting them, of course, first and foremost. So the recent 2021 OECD report on Venezuelan gold flows points out that the Maduro regime has been systematically graying the mining sector in Venezuela by not publishing any kind of data, by smuggling gold, coal pan, other minerals out of Venezuela, smuggling mercury into Venezuela, and by systematically eliminating environmental institutions. The logic is that if there's no information, no data, no reports, it makes it more difficult to denounce the criminality, the abuse, and corruption. Next slide. This is just a, this is just to show you where um, the violence uh, is located, and not surprisingly, the violence is in the mining region. So, <clears throat> this southern Venezuela has become the most violent area in Venezuela, and probably one of the most violent areas in the world. Mining sites are exploited by state and non-state groups, including Colombian National Liberation Army, the ELN, FARC dissident, <clears throat> who are promoting violence, slave labor, child labor, prostitution, disintegration of indigenous social structures, and so on. Um, let's go to the next slide. I'm now gonna focus on three emblematic areas. The first is Canaima, with Angel Falls, the highest waterfall in the world. Um, <clears throat> this is where we started with SOS on Orinoco and reporting to UNESCO. Um, so far, next slide, this week marks the 60th anniversary of, oh wait, I think it's wonderful. The 60th anniversary of that one. That shows the mining footprint of Canaima, the, the mines inside, so 59 sectors inside and on the buffer of the World Heritage Site. And this is increasing by the day. Um, by 2021, we have matched 1,540 hectares of gold mining within the uh, World Heritage Site. Next. So this type of mining, unfortunately, uses mercury, large quantities of mercury, um, and it's uh, obviously, it has a great destructive impact on water bodies, soil, flora, fauna, and most importantly, on people, the indigenous people in particular. Um, SLS Oyoko did a report that remains confidential so as to protect the authors of the report, but we found through indirect sampling um, that mercury in mining areas of the upper Caroline Basin, um, there's mercury in fish, sediments, human hair, and this table shows how children um, in the population, in one population that was uh, sampled, the levels of mercury are way above what is established as a limit by the WHO. So sadly, all this mining has plunged the Bemont people in Bolivia into violence and radical culture, uh, culture change. Next. The next area is Yapacana National Park. Um, most of you have not heard about this park, but it's, it's a national park because of its um, amazing biodiversity. But also, it's become well known because it's become a park and ELN fiefdom within Venezuela. Next. So by April of this year, we had mapped almost 3,000 hectares of mining within this park. Next. This is a high resolution satellite image that reveals all the white patches of mining, okay? If you look closely, you will see the white patches on top of the tepul. How does that happen? The only way is if you have logistical help 
from the armed forces of Venezuela who have helicopters. To date, the FARC does not have helicopters yet, but those helicopters are provided by the armed forces of Venezuela. So without doubt, Yapacana is the largest and least regulated mining area in the entire Orinoco and Amazon region, including Colombia, and serves as probably the main source of financial support for the FARC business. Next. And then last, um, I want to focus on the upper or uh, area where there have been massacres uh, recently. Um, according to reports by Yanomami and Nequana in, the, in Brazil in 2021-22, has been the worst year with regard to the invasion of the Garimpeiro, so the illegal Brazilian miners in Yanomami lands. And of course, we're feeling this on the Venezuelan side too. The Venezuelan state was pretty much abandoned uh, the region, there's no health, there's no safety, and basically the armed forces have partnered with the Garipeos in order to do illegal gold mining in these pristine areas. This is a Reserva de Biofera, Biosphere Reserve, um, and it's the land, ancestral lands of the Yanomami. Next. So until recently, it was very difficult to actually see the mines with satellite images. But these mines have now increased in size, so we're now able to see them with high-resolution satellite images. And this is these are photos of some of the mines. We gave um, a Yanomami a phone, and these are the photos that he took, um, risking his life. And you can see that there are you know, helicopters. These are being flown in from Boavista. There are approximately 200 Garibayos in this area. And this is the uh, Alto Camo, my amazing friend and mentor, Robin Henry Tennyson, who's here. We were just talking about this. He went to the Alto Camo. I went to the Alto Camo, and it was pristine. And now there are 200 Garibayos. Um, next, we're going to, this is, in Delgado Chaguan, which is the border of Brazil and Venezuela, these are the headwaters of the Orinoco. Um, there are 85 machines and hundreds of Garibayos working this, all in partnership with the Venezuelan armed forces. Uh, and this is where there was a massacre just a few, uh, two months ago. We can talk about that later, but I, I don't want to take up too much time. I will just finish the next one. I want to finish with this image. Um, it looks rather like a contemporary art piece made of Jackson Pollock. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not. It's a high resolution image of a mine in the Aquamine. Mm -hmm. So I just want to end with this thought that we believe that the threats to security of Venezuela and the surrounding countries cannot be confronted or understood without considering the role of its vast mineral um, wealth and its fragile environment. And the international community needs to increase the tracking of these high value resources. And it's critical to point out that the speed at which this tragedy is evolving will surely define the possibility of a future transition and the governability of such a transition. Christina, thank you very much.